Good afternoon. My name is Jürgen Matthäus. Before we get into the reading, let me take a few minutes to explain the rationale behind the book and the reading we're having today. Shortly after Hitler had been appointed Chancellor of Germany, the most prominent representative of German Jewry, Rabbi Leo Beck, is said to have declared that the thousand-year history of German Jewry was over. From our perspective, looking back on what we know now about the persecution of Jews in the 1930s and thereafter, such a statement makes perfect sense and confirms what we think Jews at the time, at least those in prominent positions, could have perceived about the future. Not surprisingly then, since the 1950s Beck's statement has often been quoted. However, there is a problem. We have no proof that Beck ever made this statement, either in 1933 or later in the 1930s. In fact, it is very likely that it was ascribed to him after the war by well-intentioned friends. We do have plenty of documentary evidence pointing to the fact that at the time, that is to say in the 1930s, Beck's public pronunciations were in keeping with the mood of most Jews in Germany. And that mood was anything but uniform when it came to future expectations. On the one hand, there was shock and confusion at the abrupt turn of events and their future escalation. On the other, there still seemed to be reason for hope that things would one way or another improve, that there would be some kind of future for Jews in the new Germany. Memoirs and other testimonies produced after the fact are unique and invaluable sources. Yet documents produced at the time, be they diaries, letters, newspaper articles, or photographs, have a special power to illuminate the past. As any history teacher knows, contemporary sources are invaluable for conveying a sense of history in the making. If only for a moment, these sources let us grasp the reality of a time when the past was still the present, when outcomes with which we are all familiar were still unknown. But when it comes to understanding the Holocaust, documents from that time period, particularly those stemming from the hands of victims, have a significance and expressiveness that goes far beyond this general rule. They can recover the hopes, fears, decisions, and actions of people, real people, too often seen merely as objects of Nazi policy. They can rescue the diversity and individuality of millions of women, men, and children whom their tormentors try to treat as faceless, undifferentiated, undifferentiated mass. And they can bring back to life the uncertainty, confusion, and disbelief of those confronted by measures and processes that made sense only in retrospect, not at the time. After all, for much of the period of Nazi rule, Jews might sense but could not see where things were heading. The architects and practitioners of German anti-Jewish policies knew how to conceal their intentions. More than that, the con contradictions and changes in Nazi policy show that in the 1930s, at least, even Nazis had no clear idea about the destination. The Holocaust, as we know it, was not a foregone conclusion. Only the contemporary records are free from the blinding clarity of hindsight. But why should such documents be coming to light only now? Why is there indeed no English language collection available for university teaching or the wider public documenting the breadth and richness of Jewish responses to Nazi persecution? For one thing, there has been the opening of Eastern European archives since the early 90s. Secreted in a Moscow archive were the entire papers of the important Jewish self-defense organization, the Central Association of German Citizens of the Jewish Faith, a rich trove of material now available at the United States Holocaust Memorial Archive and an important source Mark and I could draw on for this volume. Moreover, it has been the perpetrators and not the victims who received most attention. We have seen, for example, important new studies exploring the course of events that constitute the Holocaust and providing new answers to the questions how, when, 
and why the Nazis and their collaborators did what they did. What has found surprisingly little, little scholarly interest, however, are the reactions and actions of Jews and the sources generated by them not after the Holocaust, but while it was still raging. The aim of our series on Jewish responses to persecution with its just published first volume is to fill that gap. And if these volumes achieve nothing else, they will hopefully convey the sheer richness, vitality, and depth of witness records preserved in archives and libraries across the globe. Even when we do focus on records produced at the time, one might ask whether we can really understand that time and the special circumstances of the Nazi era. In Germany in the 1930s, Jewish individuals and agencies operated in a strange space with narrowing walls of surveillance and marginalization, but also within what one can call a Jewish sphere, devoid of the institutional pressures that non-Jewish groups had to confront with, conform with. To understand a report or article written by a Jewish man or woman under such circumstances, we need to be able to read between the lines of a text that had to be meaningful to its Jewish recipients while staying within the limits set by the Gestapo. We need, in other words, to listen closer beyond the mere informational content to understand the undertones, the whispers, and the rever reverberations. Thus, in introducing the various texts featured in the book, we have tried to convey a sense of the circumstances of their production and communication. A great many documents in this volume reveal the victims as thinking, feeling, reflective individuals capable of gaining striking insights into their situation. But how Jewish were such responses? Some of the statements and actions for which we have documentation undoubtedly reveal common behavior patterns that would be displayed by any group or individual confronted with such a monstrous threat. Others, however, reflect Jewish diaspora life in the first half of the 20th century with its specific political, religious, cultural, and social aspects. The narrative presented in the book consists of many partly dissonant and conflicting voices, a broad spectrum that we can only reflect to a small degree here today. This event and the volumes in the series have achieved one of their key aims if they convey a better understanding of the openness of the process in the minds of those who lived through it, like the survivors with us on this program and the authors of the sources you will hear read today. If they make us more aware of the unpredictability of the course of events, as well as of the great diversity of perceptions and reactions within the Jewish minority persecuted by Nazi Germany or one of its allies. With these volumes, we hope to deepen the understanding of Jewish agency under circumstances that increasingly reduced real options to choices between the impossible and the unthinkable. Allow me to briefly introduce our volunteer readers. They were all born in Germany or Austria, and they all have a very rich uh, biography that I can not do really justice here by, by introducing them. Margit Meissner spent her childhood in Prague, Czechoslovakia, and in 1941 came to the United States via France, Spain, and Portugal. Peter Lande came to the United States in 1937 from Berlin. Jill Pauli lived in the Rhine area near Cologne and emigrated with her family first to Kenya and after the war to the United States. Her husband Kurt left Germany in 1936 for Palestine before he moved on to America in 1938. Susan Wasinger came to France in 1938 and joined her parents in the United States in September 1941. Susan Taubes' biography reflects experiences that go far beyond what we feature in this volume, but will address in future volumes in the series. Born in a town in Thuringia, she was deported from Berlin to the Riga ghetto in Latvia in January 1942 with her grandmother, mother, and sister. Her grandmother was killed in the Rumuli forest. In fall 1943, Susan, her mother, and sister were taken to the Kaiserwald concentration camp near Riga, from where they were deported to Stutthof 
concentration camp in August 1944. Her sister died in Stutthof, her mother in a labor camp near Thorn. 